right, let's pray. Father God, it is a real joy to be able to sing to you and uh, to witness three baptisms of, of those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, but now are alive in Christ, new birth, new life. And so God, I pray that you will guide us this morning, that we will learn from your word, that you will bless us to grow in a deeper knowledge of your word. God, thank you for uh, salvation. Thank you for a place to worship you and to sing to you and to learn uh, what you have revealed to us about yourself. And so, God, I pray that you will use me to speak with clarity this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I uh, told you, I told him the first service, many of you know, my sister got married this weekend. And so yesterday she got married and uh, as family, you know, you know what you do in, when you're family and you're part of the wedding party, right? You do whatever's asked of you. And so that's what me and mom and dad, we all did. We, we did whatever was asked of us. And so it was foggy up in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, it was wet. It was cold. Um, but it ended up being a beautiful wedding. And at the end, my mom and dad went and got the place that we were going to eat at. And um, I stayed around and I cleaned up and... Uh, you know, hands were cold, wet, just what you do for family, right? You just serve. And so we went to eat, and uh, we ate at this place called Mikado's. You know, my sister, American, married somebody from England. We eat at Japanese restaurants. You know, completely normal. And um, so we go to a Japanese restaurant to eat, and we get finished eating, and I'm walking around, I'm telling everyone bye, and I look at Jonathan, my new brother-in-law, right? I look at him, and he says, thank you for everything. And I just look at him, and I say one word, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the good, the bad, and the ugly, Jonathan. <laughs> My mom and dad looked at his mom and dad and, uh, and said, we'll treat him like a son. And they will. They'll treat him like a son. And I'll treat him like a brother. Why? Because he's our family. Being a part of a family is a big deal. In my family, uh, we had, I had a great mom and dad growing up, and so they told me I could call them at any time. Anytime I could have access to my mom and dad. Why? Because we were family. And so there's often times where I would call them at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Sometimes I just wanted to talk. Sometimes I had a question. And so I would call mom and dad. It didn't matter what time it was. If it was 1130 at night, they would wake up. Even if sometimes it was a question about a movie, which they could have probably killed me. Like They should have been like, what are you doing? Call me 1130. But they didn't. They woke up and, and they answered. Why? Why did I have that type of access? Because of family. Because family matters. I'll never forget when we were living in North Carolina... We lived beside of a pastor, and he had a family. It was two pastors on this corner, right? That, that, that corner was taken care of in prayer, I promise you. Um, and we lived there, and um, they came from a little bit more of a, a legalistic background. I don't say a little bit. They, they had a legalistic background. Um, grew up in a holiness denomination. And so uh, their daughter uh, was about the same age as my daughter's, and she always had to have a dress on. Uh, she couldn't have, couldn't hurt her hair, no ears pierced or anything like that. And then you have my Hannah, who is in gymnastics. And so she does cartwheel after cartwheel after cartwheel after cartwheel in gymnastics clothes with her ears pierced. That was the corner, right? And so my oldest daughter, Lydia, comes in one day and she says, uh, Dad, um, our neighbor is telling Hannah how she's a terrible sinner. How that she's against God for piercing her ears. She's against God for how she's dressing. And so I got both the girls and I asked them to come up to their room and I brought them up to their room and I sat them on the bed and I explained the gospel to them. And I explained to them uh, where they pulled that verse of scripture and that what it meant. And I explained the gospel and I said, listen, you know what daddy is called to do for a living, right? And they said, you're the pastor. I said, yeah. I said, people, 
people come and, and I shepherd them and they ask me questions about the Bible. But I want you to know that if you ever have a question about the gospel or about the Bible, you have access to me anytime. Do not let someone else teach you what I'm called to teach you. Do you understand? And they're like, now if they can be like that the rest of their life. <laughs> right? That a, a girl says something and they're just like, okay, well my dad said that's not true. And so we'll go on. That would be wonderful. Pray for that. Um, but what I wanted them to know is that they have access to me. My parents want me to know I have access to them. Jonathan now is a part of our family and he has access. If he needs me, I'm there. If he needs me, if my sister needs me, I'm there. Because that's what family is. And there's so many ways we could describe family. And I tell you all those illustrations uh, really to say what Tim Keller is saying. Listen to a Tim Keller quote. He says, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. We have that kind of access. Here in Ephesians, Paul is writing to a church, a church made up of Gentiles. And these Gentiles uh, were thought of as separate from God's people, alienated from God's people, not a part of the covenant of promise. That's how they were thought. They were dead in their trespasses and sins, and they were alienated from God. But through Christ, listen to what it says here in verse 11 of chapter 3. Ephesians 3, verse 11. This was according to the eternal promise that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Church, we have access to God. Because of Jesus. Like, do you understand that? Like, I know I have access to my parents and my, my kids have access to me. But we, who are alienated Gentiles with no hope, we now, through Christ, have access to the holies of holy. We have access to God. And we can come before God in boldness because of Christ. In boldness. In Judaism, um, what would happen is that the high priest could have access to God for a brief moment on the Day of Atonement. If you look that up, look it up in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 16. For a brief moment, the high priest in Judaism, in the Old Testament, okay, the, the high priest would have a brief moment of access to God. And if he come before God in an unholy manner, he was struck dead. In that brief moment where he, get, he, went, he got to go behind the veil and access God, the holies of holies, if he went to him in a sinful way, he died. But he had that brief moment of access. People waited outside, waited outside the tent. Because of Christ, that veil has been torn, church family, and we have access 24-7. Wrap your minds around that. We can come to God unholy and sinful, and we get to have access to God and bow down before him. And the only people that can do that is the, ch the children of God. And that's who we are as children of God. And so if you look at chapter 2, verse 19, listen to what it says. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. We are fellow members of the household of God because of Christ. So before I get into my sermon, the three points of most typical Southern Baptist pastors, right? Before I get there, I need you to grab hold of this truth here. This is the truth I need you to grab hold of in Ephesians chapter 3. That you, as a follower of Christ, have unlimited access to come before God, the Father, okay? Come before God with boldness, the boldness of being his child. So the truth, you, as a follower of Christ, have unlimited access to come before God with the boldness of being his child. That's the truth I need you to grab hold of. When you grab hold of that truth, you'll realize something. 
You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, you who were alienated from God, now you have been brought to be a part of the children of God. You have been brought. As if you have repented of your sins and followed Jesus, then Jesus has brought you to God, reconciled you, and now you are sons and daughters of the Most High. What does that mean? How do you respond to that? Will you respond as any family would respond? It's a two-way street, right? It's a two-way street. Because we have access to God, because we have been reconciled to God, because we are redeemed, that should in turn affect our life. Should affect our life. We who were dead in our trespasses and sins, now we are born again and we have a living hope. Our lives have been transformed. We have a new purpose. We have a new life. We have a new mission. So for you who are followers of Christ, you have access to God as part of his family. And now the father who controls your family is telling you to do something. Commanding his sons and daughters to do something. And let's look at chapter 3 and let's see what he's commanding his sons and daughters to do. Look at chapter 3 verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul... A prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. See, Paul understood this truth, that there is nothing more important, there's nothing that we should value more as believers than to exalt the name of God. He knew that. And so that's what he was doing. For this reason, because I am a follower of Christ, because I have been redeemed, I am a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. I'm not a prisoner because I'm held captive by some jailer. I am a prisoner because that's what Christ has called me to. That's what he's called me to, for his glory. And so... um, Same thing that is being said here is the same thing uh, that is said in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Paul, for this reason I, Paul, became a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. That I have a calling on my life. I have a mission mission calling on my life to spread the gospel and the mystery of the gospel to the Gentiles. Because I am God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works. And church, we are too. We are too. When you have access to God and you are a part of the family of God, then you are commissioned by God to bring him glory. Your commission to bring. And there's nothing that we should value more than to exalt the name of our Father. Because he sent his Son, our Savior, to redeem us. And so Paul is saying, for this reason, I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Verse 3. Pay attention to this word. How the mystery, mystery, was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Again, the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery, verse 6, the mystery is that we Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promised in Christ Jesus through The gospel. That is the mystery. And so for here, Paul is saying, I am in prison. Not in prison because somebody put me there. I'm in prison because Christ wanted me to, to go to prison and be an example and a light that shines for him on behalf of the Gentiles. He has called me to preach the gospel in church. He has called us as his children to do the same. He's called us to do the same, to preach the gospel, the mystery of the gospel to the Gentiles and to everyone. And so if you look in Romans verse, or sorry, if you look in Ephesians chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, this is what it says. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now what's that? That's, that's the promise to Abraham, right? To promise through him, all the families on earth will be blessed. Now, Galatians 3, 28 and 29 says this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, listen to what this says, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. You see it? That we have access to God. We are followers of God. Because we are followers of God, we are sons and daughters of the Most High. And now we go out and we tell people the gospel. So point number one. Point number one. It's a call to preach the gospel to everyone. We are called, as Paul, to be ambassadors for the gospel. We are called to tell this mystery that we are a part of the promise of Abraham, that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is slave nor free, nor male nor female, that if you are in Christ and you are a part of Abraham's offspring and you are a part of the family of God and church, that's what we are called to proclaim to this world because we're a part of the family. And we are called to tell and proclaim that truth to everyone else in this world so they can be a part of the family too. It's our job. It's our role in the family that the Father has called us to go and make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and to teach them all that I have commanded you. That's what we're called to do. If you say, well, in Christianity, explain to me Christianity, you would say, man, we're sinners Jesus came, who is the Son of God, and he was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross, and on the third day he rose from the tomb. And if you repent and follow him, you will be a part of the family of God. And they'll say, what's that mean to follow him? It means you deny yourself. It means you be obedient to his teachings. You know what his teachings are? For us to go and to make disciples, for us to love God and to love others, for us to glorify him and make disciples of all nations. That's what it means to follow him. To follow his word and follow his commands and follow his commissioning and follow his teachings. That's what Christianity is. And so the same thing that Paul is showing us here. If it means we suffer in prison, then we suffer in prison because God is worthy. Our father is worthy of that. And so he is saying, that's what God has called me to do. He has the right perspective. That's what God's called me to do. And that's what I'm going to do. If I suffer, then I suffer. But I am proclaiming the gospel to the Gentiles. And we are called to do the same thing, church. Because we are the Gentiles. So we are called. It's a call to preach the gospel to everyone. Continue on in verse 7. Of this gospel, this gospel that I'm called to preach, this mystery that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, that if you repent and follow Jesus, then you are part of the family of God. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Because of his grace which was given me by the working of his power to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. Maybe that's you this morning. Well, pastor, I know I'm supposed to go call to preach the gospel. I'm called to preach the gospel to everybody, but I'm the least. And what's my testimony going to do? Same thing Paul feels. Okay? I am the very least of the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles. What are we called to preach to the Gentiles? Not only the gospel, but the unsearchable riches of Christ, verse 9, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And so the second point that you need to grab hold of this morning is it's not only a call to preach the gospel to everyone, it is a call to preach the riches of the gospel. And this is what I want us to grab hold of this morning in this, in this um, second point. You are not only called to know the gospel as believers in Christ. You're not only called to preach the gospel to everyone as you are going. Go, therefore, and make disciples as you're going through life. But you are called to live the riches of the gospel. So, so how, do you, how do you preach the riches of the gospel? Well, do you stand on the sidewalk and scream at people, You're going to hell! Is that that preaching the riches of the gospel? No, it's to show them in your life. Your life should be winsome. That when struggles come to your life, anxiety pops up in your life, that you have a comfort about you that's attractive to this lost world. Why? Because you know that you have a God who is all wise and all knowing. You have access to a God who will never leave you nor forsake you, who will wrap his arms around you. 
And so you are called not only to proclaim the gospel that Jesus came, but you are called to proclaim the riches of the gospel. Let me read to you some of those riches of the gospel. Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. The wisdom and knowledge, all knowing, all wise. Ephesians 2, 4. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And so we see God's wisdom. We see the riches of his knowledge. We see the riches of his mercy and the riches of his love. Colossians 2, 2. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to, the, to reach all the riches of full assurance. You see it. When you are talking about the gospel and somebody looks at you and they say, why are you a Christian? What in your life is different? You say, let me tell you about the riches of my God and his wisdom. Let me tell you about the riches of his knowledge. Let me tell you about the riches of his love and the riches of his grace. Let me tell you about the riches, as Colossians says, of full assurance that I have a God who will never leave me nor forsake me. It should bubble out of you the joy that you have because Jesus is Lord of your life and you have access to God. That when someone says, why do you follow Jesus? You say, oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you about a God who sent his son to die for me. Let me tell you about a God who allows me access to him anytime I want. Let me tell you about a God who loves me unconditionally. Let me tell you about a God who is gracious with me and merciful to me. Let me tell you about a God that knows all things and is in control of all things but holds me near. Let me tell you about that God. Let me tell you about the riches of the gospel. This world don't need to see us walking around helpless and hopeless. This world needs to see us with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. They need to see us different. They need to see us boast of the cross and boast of the goodness of God. They need to look at our lives and say, what's different about you? And you say, you say I have a Savior who loves me. I have a Savior who gave his life for me. I have a Savior who will never leave me nor forsake me. I have a Savior that wraps his arms around me in my darkest places. He pulls me out. I have that Savior. Church. We proclaim the riches of the gospel. That's what we're called to do. We have access to God. We are part of the family of God. And now we have a commissioning to go and preach the gospel and to tell people how wonderful he is and the depth of who he is and the riches of that gospel. That you, who are afraid of death, when you come to Christ, there is no fear anymore. That one day we will have eternity with God because of Jesus. For you who struggle with stuff in your past, you get to come to a God who says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It shocks me that people are scared to tell others the gospel. Look, I don't want to offend them. You're not offending them. You're telling them how wonderful Jesus is and you're setting them free. You're helping them. You're encouraging them. You're telling them that they have a God who will never leave them nor forsake them. You're telling them that they don't have to live this world hopeless and helpless. That they have a God that gave his son to die for them. So yes, church, we, we are called to preach the gospel. And we are called to preach the riches of the gospel. Because we are part of the family of God and access to God. This is what Paul is showing us here. That he will suffer because God's worthy of it. He will proclaim the riches even when he is chained in a cell. He will proclaim the riches of the gospel in the midst of suffering. Because God is good, church. And he is worthy. He is good and he is worthy. Point number three. Point number three. Continue on. We'll go with verse nine again. And to bring to light to everyone, for everyone, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Verse 10. So that through the individual. Is that what it says? Through the parachurch ministry. Through the conference. Is that what it says? No, no, no. It says so that through... The church. And I'm not here to talk about conferences or parachurches. I love a lot of them have great things. Don't hear me say that. But realize something. That the church is God's plan A and there is no plan B. Jesus died for the church. The gates of hell will not triumph over the church. Okay? And so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Third point, church. 
We are called to be a part of his church for his glory. So if I'm, a, if I'm talking to a non-Christian out there and they go, what's it mean to be a Christian? I tell them the gospel. What's the benefit to that? I tell them the riches of the gospel. Eternal life. No damnation. No condemnation. And then they say, well, I see you on Sunday mornings. You're at church. Why? Well, you know what I'm not going to tell them? Well, it's just kind of a social gathering. We kind of get together and we talk about what we like and what we want for ourselves and we sing songs that we want and we like. That's not what I'm going to tell them. I'm going to say that we are the local body who have come together as a faith family, as a covenant family to go out to Ray County, to Tennessee, to North America, and to the ends of the earth and proclaim the gospel and the riches of the gospel. So we're not a cruise ship, church. We're a battleship. We come together to exalt Jesus and to make him known in this lost and dying world. That's what the church is. And so we come in here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, to encourage one another and to help disciple one another and to sing to Jesus and to bow down to Jesus and then to leave here and proclaim Jesus to this lost and dying world. The money you give is to support that. The songs that we sing is to support uh, the word that's being taught. Everything we do has to have purpose. This sanctuary remodel, let me go ahead and just throw this out there. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's going to be so that we can further the name of Jesus. So that we can have a place where it's more welcoming. We can have a place that's more handicap accessible. That's why we're doing that. This is not about us. This is about God. It's about his glory. And so we're called to be a part of this church. You hear people say all the time, well, you know, I know I love Jesus. I don't have to be a part of his church. Well, if you don't want to be a part of his church, you don't want to see his power. Because he works through his church. Why? Because we're his bride. That's why the, the scripture, when he's talking about all these churches at Ephesus and, and at, at the church of Galatians, Galatia, right? All these churches, they're, they're churches. They have elders that are called there to shepherd and love and protect the sheep and to point you and to equip you to do the work of the ministry, to reach this world. So that's why we're here. To learn and to grow and to exalt Jesus and to, and to proclaim him to this lost and dying world. To help the least. That's why we go to Africa. That's why we do Foray County events. When we do something here as a church, we, should, we, shouldn't even, we, we, should, we shouldn't even have a need. Our church should be coming to bind together and, and to do stuff for Ray County, to do stuff for Tennessee, to do stuff for North America, and do stuff for the ends of the earth. Why? Because that's what we're commissioned to do that's who we are and so we as a faith family we agree to a covenant together a covenant a covenant's a promise that we have made together and to god in this covenant we have five things that we've agreed to before god and god holds us to it number one god will hold us that we have made a covenant to commit to one another to commit to one another to commit to disciple one another to commit to love one another Number two, we have made a commitment to the church, to give to the church, to serve the church. Whatever the church is doing, we are committed and fully in. So if you're a member here, this is what you've committed to in front of God. This is what God will hold you to. If you're not a member of a church, you need to be a member of a local body that preaches the Bible because it's God's plan A. Okay? And so, commitment to one another. Number two, commitment to the church. Number three, we have committed in this covenant to live out the gospel. To live out the gospel. So we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to, to live out and preach the riches of the gospel. That's what we've committed to. Number four, we have committed to love and unity. To love and unity. When a church is, is outwardly focused and it's focused on exalting Jesus, we don't have time to focus on bickering. Once a church becomes inward focused, they're not a church anymore. They're a social club. Once a church becomes inward focus, it's a social club. It's not a church that is following Jesus, exalting Jesus, and being obedient to the commands Jesus uh, has given us. 
All right, so we commit to loving you. And then fifthly, we commit to continue. To continue. That's the five things. Commit to one another. Commit to the church. Commit to live out the gospel. Commit to love and unity. And commit to continue. And so we, as the local body of New Union, we come together as a faith family to love one another, to encourage one another, to exalt Jesus, and to proclaim Jesus to this lost and dying world. And that's what we do. To worship him, to live in community, to reach lost and disciple the saved. That's who we are, church. And can I say this? Your pastors are, we are so thankful for you. We are so thankful for you. I need you to hear that. You hear a sermon like this and you ask, what are you saying, pastor? Do you, do you think we're inward focused? No. I think God has blessed us because we glorify him. And I think that our missions is growing. I think we're seeing people saved. Why? Because we love Jesus and we seek to exalt him. And so as one of your pastors, this speaks for all of our pastors here. We are thankful for you and we love you and we appreciate you. But don't ever get inward focused. We have access to God to preach the gospel, to preach the riches of the gospel, and to be a part of his church for his glory. And that's what we're commissioned to do and that's who we're going to continue to be. We're a battleship, not a cruise ship, church. We are called to go out and proclaim the gospel in the midst of a dark and hopeless world. And so your pastors are thankful for you, and we love you, and we appreciate you. All right, I want to tie up, I want to wrap up the sermon, and I'll say this. Many of you, as your pastor, I want to look at you and say, you may be walking in sin. You may be struggling through life. Your marriage may be hurting. You came here to hear hope. So let me give you this hope. Let me give you this assurance. You, as a follower of Christ, are of value to your Father. And in your hurting and in your brokenness, you can bow down and have access to God today. There is no sin that can hold you back from the access of your Father. And He is waiting on you to bow down to Him. And then He wants you to get up and He wants you to preach the gospel and preach the riches of the gospel and be a part of His church for His glory. And when you struggle, He wants you to draw near to Him and let Him wrap His arms around you and then say, Son, daughter, it's going to be okay. Now go do my work for my glory. Mike is learning to walk. He's walking. And when he fell, you know what I did? I grabbed him. I didn't yell at him. I didn't push him down. I grabbed him. And I gave him a hug. And I wiped the tears from his face. And I kissed him on the cheek. And you know what I did after that? Gave him a little pat on the bottom. Try walking again. That's what God will do for you. Pastor, I don't know if I can preach the gospel. You don't know about the sin in my life. You don't know about the brokenness in my life. You don't know about the help, hopelessness in my life. You shouldn't be hopeless. You just bow down to God. Let him wrap his arms around you and then let him just, just tap you and send you on your way for the glory of God. Look to him, church. Find hope in him. And be the Christian and the son and daughter that he's called you to be. At my sister's wedding, I did whatever I could. Why? It's my responsibility. It's our responsibility as sons and daughters of the Most High to do whatever God calls us to do for His glory. So let's be faithful. Let's pray. Father, Your Word is powerful. Your Word is good. And it is just a great blessing right now that I have access to You. And so right now, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that maybe life has been tough for them. I, I want them to know they have access to you. What other person would you rather go to besides you? And so, God, I pray that today they will go to you and they will find the hope and love of a loving Father who will wrap his arms around them. 
And then, Father, our God, I pray that we will leave here today ready to preach the gospel and to preach the riches of the gospel and ready to serve the church for the glory of God. So, God, bless my brothers and sisters. Thank you for them. Move in their life. May they praise your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and sing.